Listen, just one more thing. Uh... Hello there. Welcome to my review of episode one of season four of Columbo, an exercise in fatality. First broadcast on the 15th of September 1974 on NBC. It was written by Peter S. Fisher, based on a story by Larry Cohen, and directed by Bernard L. Kowalski, all returning from having worked on previous episodes. This episode begins in a very typical 1970s gym. A phone rings in reception, but before the receptionist answers it, she starts a tape recorder which I'm almost certain was not typical for gyms in the 1970s. Please do correct me if I'm wrong. This was just after Watergate, after all. Buddy Castle is calling for Milo Janus, but Jess, the receptionist, informs him Janus is on the other line, so he asks for Janus to call him back. We then cut to Milo Janus in his office. Janice is played by Robert Conrad. Conrad was born Conrad Robert Falk, no relation to Peter Falk, on the 1st of March 1935 in Chicago. He dropped out of school at 15 to work full time and also studied theatre arts at Northwestern University. Due to his resemblance to James Dean, one of his first acting jobs was to stand outside a cinema that was screening Giant as a promotional gimmick. He also took vocal lessons at this time from Dick Marks, father of Richard Marks. After a chance meeting with actor Nick Adams in 1957, the pair became friends and Adams suggested Conrad move to California. He got small roles in a few productions before signing a contract with Warner Brothers and releasing a few records as well as acting. He continued to build his career with a roster of smaller roles before being cast as the lead in Hawaiian Eye, a spin-off from 77 Sunset Strip, which lasted for four years. He was then cast in his most well-known role as Jim West, the frontier lawman in the series Wild Wild West, alongside previous Columbo murderer Ross Martin as Artemis Gordon. He would appear in film, but none of his film roles achieved the level of success of Wild Wild West, which lasted for four years but had several spin-off TV movies. He would continue to appear in television roles in the 70s, including his appearance in this episode of Columbo, as well as a few starring roles in some short-lived series. His on-screen career waned in the following decades and would be reduced to bit parts and cameos before retiring. He died on February the 8th, 2020. He was 84. Janice is on the phone to one of his employees, demanding he raise the prices on products sold to his gym chain franchisees. Those people paid a lot of money for a Milo Janice franchise, and they're going to pay a lot more to operate them. When he's finished, Jess relays the message and he instructs her to call Buddy back, but not record the conversation this time. So I guess it was a common practice in 1970s gyms. We then cut to Janice visiting Buddy at one of the franchises, who informs him that Gene Stafford, one of his franchisees, is incredibly angry with him. Janice goes to see Gene, and Gene accuses him of ripping him and the other franchisees off. He wants to know where all the money goes, because he's convinced the money isn't being declared to the government. As Janice leaves, claiming there's nothing going on, he quickly speaks to Buddy and invites him to a party at his place that night. Back at his office, he also invites Jess and asks her to fill in for him as the host, as he has an errand to run first. As this is a Columbo episode, it's pretty clear what errand he intends to run. And after she leaves, he cuts out one of the recorded conversations with Jean and takes it back to his place to set up 
on his own tape player and also fiddles with his home telephone. He then goes back to Gene's gym and tries to strangle him with a metal bar. Gene fights back and runs, but Janice is in much better shape and eventually finishes Gene off. He then dresses the scene, putting Gene in workout clothes and putting his body on a weights bench, resting a barbell on his neck to make it look like an accident. He also happens to notice he got burned by Gene's coffee maker in the struggle. He returns home to his awaiting guests and starts a movie for them while he sets up his own alibi. He rings his house phone from another line and plays the recording to Jess so she thinks that Gene is still alive. He then takes the phone call and pretends to have a conversation with the now deceased Jean. It's a clever setup that seems pretty perfect. I do wonder what a slightly younger audience might make of the abundance of obsolete technology on display here though, from the typewriter that Jess uses to the corded telephones, the tape recorders, the film projector, uh, in, G in Janice's home, all now available in a square box that fits in your pocket. I mean, the fact that Janice has a hole cut into the dividing wall of his house in order to project the movie through would have been a signifier that Janice had money at the time this episode aired. And I imagine to an audience that doesn't really even remember VHS, this concept would seem incredibly antiquated almost as bad as washing your clothes in a stream. The only thing that hasn't really changed that much is the gym equipment. It might not be earth tones and chrome now, but it's basically all the same equipment that you can find in a modern gym. I guess technology that makes us lazy changes while the stuff that keeps us fit doesn't. Anyway, Columbo makes his first appearance at the gym and refuses to hear anything about the case until he's had his first cup of coffee. A sergeant brings him up to speed on who the accident victim is, but he gets interrupted by a phone call from his wife, which he takes in Jean's office. She tells him they have guests coming over and he offers to pick up some Chinese food after he had Notice the remains of some in Gene Stafford's bin. He also notices the large coffee stain on the floor. It's fun to see Columbo speak to his wife when there's no one else around, as we know he's not putting on an act to try and catch anybody out. Although he also doesn't give too much away. As Columbo looks around, he observes some brown scuff marks on the gym floor that was waxed shortly before the gym closed, before the murder took place. He checks with the quite frankly huge number of police on the scene if any of them are wearing brown heeled shoes and they aren't. So he checks Stafford's locker, which is locked. When the janitor opens it, he finds Stafford's shoes are brown but Stafford was found wearing trainers. Columbo then has a fun little scene with the medical examiner. Well, I'm sure his windpipe was crushed, but who knows, maybe he died of a coronary first. Maybe he was poisoned. Poisoned? He sent out for some Chinese food reasoning. Yes, well, maybe some local tong had it in for him, or the delivery boy, or maybe he just died of overeating. What are you trying to tell me? Yeah, well, I, I'm trying to tell you to wait for the autopsy. Right. After testing the weight of the barbell Stafford was using, he's pretty certain it's no accident. What's nice about this scene is we really get to see Columbo as a one-man CSI unit, moving from room to room, noticing minute details that are incongruous with the facts as everybody else sees them, 
it doesn't really make sense why there are so many police at the scene of an apparent accident, but it might explain why there were so many serial killers running loose in LA in the 70s if all the cops were attending apparent accidents at gyms. The next scene is Columbo visiting Janice's home, the door of which is answered by Jess in a bikini, which leaves Columbo more than a little lost for words. I'm looking for um, uh, my little Janice. Are you sure? We know from previous episodes that he can temporarily lose focus around beautiful women in skimpy clothing, as seen with Julie Newmar in Double Shock, and he's no different here. Jess is played by Gretchen Corbett. Corbett was born Gretchen Hoyt Corbett on the 13th of August 1947 in Oregon. After attending the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, she was bitten by the acting bug and pursued an acting education before quitting to concentrate on it as a career. She began on stage before gaining small television and film roles, in, including in the 1971 film Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Shortly afterwards, she moved to Los Angeles under a contract to Universal, which led to roles in Kojak, Gunsmoke and Banachek, and of course this episode of Columbo, while also continuing to perform on stage. Her big break came in 1974 when she was cast as recurring character Beth Davenport on The Rockford Files. Davenport was a sometimes naive, sometimes manipulative lawyer and occasional love interest for James Garner's Jim Rockford. She would continue to crop up on other TV shows but was forced to leave the Rockford Files after season four due to a contract dispute between Universal and the producers of the show. She would, however, reprise the role in the later TV movies made in the 90s. She appeared in films and on television after Rockford, although her main interest remained the stage, where she continues to perform. Most recently, she appeared in the critically acclaimed Nicolas Cage movie, Pig. She is 74. Columbo eventually composes himself and asks to see Milo Janus. He asks if Jess is Mrs Janus and she says no, she's his secretary. He then asks how old Janus is and is astounded to find out he's 53. Janus arrives and we get more insight into Columbo's home life, which you have to judge for yourself how true it all is. He breaks the news and Janice instantly suggests that it was a heart attack that killed Jean. Janice is quick to provide his alibi as well, using Jess to confirm it in such a way that seems like he isn't giving an alibi. And Columbo notices Janice's burn. Columbo then goes to see Stafford's widow. Ruth, played by Colin Wilcox Paxton. Paxton is perhaps most famous for playing Myala Violet Ewell in To Kill a Mockingbird. She plays a more sympathetic character here. Columbo discovers that Stafford was having problems with Janice and who Lacey, someone mentioned in Stafford's work diary several times, is. When Jean was working for Tricon Industries, there was a man named Lacey. Lewis Lacey. Lewis. Columbo then goes to see Janice at the beach, and he's lucky not to bump into Jim Rockford or Beth Davenport, as it's where Rockford's trailer is located. Janice makes Columbo follow him as he continues his exercises and nearly kills the lieutenant. He eventually gets his breath back and starts asking about Buddy Castle, played by Pat Harrington Jr. Harrington was a prolific character actor, perhaps best known for his role as building superintendent Dwayne Schneider on the sitcom One Day at a Time. Columbo inquires about Buddy's criminal record for fraud, and in a telling moment, 
Janice says he completely trusts Buddy because Buddy is as honest as he is. Janice then asks why Columbo is there if it was an accident. And Columbo explains he doesn't think it was an accident due to the signs of struggle. He explains exactly what actually happened to gauge Janice's response, destroys his alibi and notices his phone is not working as it should, meaning that when Jess answered she wouldn't have been able to tell that the phone call was coming from inside the house. So now he has the theory of means and opportunity, he just needs a motive and also how to prove all three. He goes to see the mysterious Lacey and his struggle with civil servants goes as well as it has in previous episodes. We then get a very funny scene in which pure Peter Fork genius sees him leave a message for Mr Lacey on his answering machine. This is Lieutenant Columbo. I'm from the Homicide Department of the Police. I would like to speak to you as soon as possible. You can reach me at the main precinct. The telephone number there is... You can look that up. The next scene is Mr. Lacey visiting with Mrs. Stafford. It turns out Mr. Lacey is an accountant who has been working for Gene Stafford and he informs Mrs. Stafford all about Janice. It seems that Lacey is being quite thorough with his forensic accountancy of all of Janice's business dealings. In the meantime, Columbo speaks with Buddy Castle. He grills Castle, having already spoken to Mr. Lacey, and Castle gives his alibi and denies knowing anything about Janice's business dealings, being only a minor shareholder. He then drives off in his shiny expensive sports car. Columbo then goes to see Jess at the gym office and while he's there he sees the elaborate recording system and hears a phone call come in from Mrs Stafford. He then further chips away at he then further chips away at Janice's alibi, working out exactly how the arranged phone call from beyond the grave happened. Mrs Stafford and Janice meet for dinner and Mrs Stafford reveals all she knows. So Janice tries to seduce her and she walks out. The next day Janice arrives at his gym and Columbo is there working out, which is quite a sight. He also happens to be there to question Janice on how Stafford was able to lift the barbell when he'd never lifted anything near that heavy previously. He continues to disassemble every red herring that, Staff that Janice had left in setting up Stafford's murder and he also informs Janice that Mrs Stafford has come forward with all the information about the potential fraud. Or actually lack of it. Because as it's revealed here, Janice wasn't really doing anything technically illegal. Columbo then goes to see Mrs Stafford in the hospital as she's apparently taken an accidental overdose. Janice is there at the hospital hoping to see her and Columbo confronts him in another rare angry outburst. He flat out accuses Janice with absolutely everything he knows and Janice accuses him of being devious and Columbo actually admits to being devious. You know something Columbo? You're a devious man. That's what they tell me. Janice tells him he didn't do it and Columbo can't prove he did. Janice then goes to his office and, while there, he gets a phone call from Gene Stafford. He runs out of the office and Columbo is at reception playing a recording of Gene's voice. He has a warrant and has found the tape with the section that Janice cut out. 
Janus again claims there is no proof of Columbo's theory. And Columbo explains that Stafford's shoelaces must have been tied by somebody else, not by Stafford himself. Janus swore that Stafford said he was in his gym clothes when they spoke on the phone. But that simply can't have been the case, as Janus is the only one who knew he was in his gym clothes. I have very mixed feelings about this episode, not least because it finishes with the Milo Janus gym theme song, which is a very odd choice. But the story itself suffers greatly from being 95 minutes long. There is a lot of filler that isn't always as obvious as other episodes, as it seems to be moving the plot forward, but actually isn't, as there are several scenes of Columbo repeatedly making the same points about Janice's alibi. Rather than unravelling each clue one by one, it's a mixture of several things at once, over and over again. This could have been a really tight 75 minute episode had it been restructured and re-edited but as it is it just feels flabby and a bit repetitive. The subplot with Mrs Stafford never really goes anywhere satisfying and certain points aren't really hammered home enough. I feel like it should have been clear that Janice wasn't actually breaking the law with his business dealings, but didn't realise it, meaning he didn't actually really need to kill Stafford. I thought the thing with the shoelace was very clever, but how it meant Janice must have been the killer was a little bit weak. The idea of his own words condemning him was fine, but it's been done better in other episodes. Had this been a 75 minute episode with some liberal cuts, I probably would have given it a 4 out of 5, but at 95 minutes it's too long, too messy, and really only worth a 2 out of 5. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>